Welcome to The Big Break Show, a podcast where we discuss short-term rentals, entrepreneurship, life, mindset, and everything in between. Here are your hosts, Rafaloza and Jesse Vasquez. What's up, everybody? We're back again with the same old boring intro and my laggy friend, Jesse, Mr. Vasquez. What is up, everybody? Welcome to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to The Big Break Show. Welcome back to the Big Break Show. We're here today, chat with Matt Kruger, who is based out of where's he at again? Rafa, Indy? No, not Indy. He's out of no. Iowa. I kept saying Illinois, but it's Iowa. Iowa, yeah. Cool story. Uh, super humble dude. Came from a very simple working class family, and it sounds like he's built. It doesn't sound he's built a pretty freaking solid business, and he does what a lot of solid investors do that aren't necessarily making a bunch of cash, where they just buy a property once a year, live in it, and then move and compound it over time, dude. That guy's Built a pretty substantial portfolio, man. Nine years, 12 properties, and now he's quit his job, has a ton of fucking wealth, and now uh, he's cash flowing a, a, a lot, you know? And he's like, he's just crushing it. I, I was really happy that he came on the show. I, I wanted to have him on a while ago so we can talk about his journey because like, he started like most people always say that they can't start because of the life circumstances. He had a job that wasn't paying a lot of money. He's got kids, right? He has no free time. And he made it work. And now he is free, financially free, has the freedom to do whatever he wants, uh, has his kids. I mean, he's crushing it. He's spending three months right now in Texas or something, some island in Texas. I don't even know they had islands there. And he's he's doing well for himself. And he started with circumstances that most people would be like, oh, it's too much. I can't do it. 35K a year. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. 35K a year. So his, his story is awesome. Uh, it was funny because like he kept saying super short stories during the podcast. I'm like, bro, give some detail. But I'm excited that he came on. I think the listeners are really going to enjoy this one. Uh, I'm excited to see his growth and where he's going because, I mean, it, it's fun to see. Not to mention he drops great content on Instagram. He's, I mean, on, on TikTok and Instagram. He's quite the influencer there. So, um, And he does some good content educating and helping people. So, um, yeah, man, it's exciting to see. And it's, 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 a nice, it's nice to see someone who's crushing it and such a good dude. Yeah, for sure, man. Yeah, you guys are going to enjoy this one. Without further ado, Mr. Matt Kruger. Hey, guys, Rafa here. A lot of you guys have been asking me if I have a course, if I teach, if I mentor my short-term rental business. And the answer is I do, actually. I just recently released my very first course. It has about 120 videos. If you're part of the monthly membership, we are adding two new videos a month in current issues or projects that I'm working on within the short-term rental business. And we do one monthly call live where you have access to me to ask me all the questions you want. So if you're interested in joining the course or if you want any more info, click the link below it is application only we only open it to a certain amount of students every month because we want people who are serious who really want to be a part of this who actually want to take their short-term rental business and grow it or starting from scratch and want to learn how to actually acquire properties doing rental arbitrage if that's you if you're serious and you really want to do this click the link below schedule a call with me or my team and we'll get you going now back to the show matt super stoked to have you on the program man welcome thank you for being here I see that you have a giant turtle behind your head right now. Can you tell us what's the backstory on that turtle, dude? What's going on there? Is that Crush from uh, Finding Nemo? You know, I'm not quite sure. Uh, thank you guys for having me. We uh, we're actually down on South Padre Island in Texas right now, and I am sitting in a little condo that we're about to uh, to launch here on Airbnb within the next uh, week, hopefully. But uh, this is some of the uh, some of the island decor that I get to enjoy. So it's nice. nice I like it. every time I see a, a turtle like that. It reminds me of Crush from uh, Finding Nemo. Like Crush, Crush is cool, man. The little stoner turtle. He's, like, he's my kind of guy. He's always like dude and bro and man, Rafa. Right? Have you ever watched Finding Nemo? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was good. Dude, I've got I've got four kids under seven, so <laughs> yes, I've watched that movie many times. <laughs> <laughs> I love that movie. I got a question. I know before you dive into what you have going on, condos in Texas, HOA regulations, yay or nay? What's your thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, personally, I feel like uh, at least where we are on South Padre Island, it's a lot more flexible down here for sure. They're very supportive of uh, of STRs. Um, so there are a few HOAs that are more like, you know, midterm, um, you know, pro midterm, like they won't allow less than 28 days um, or 28 nights. But a lot of them here are, are pretty cool with it. So um, there's a lot on the island, though. So you really have to do do more to stand out for sure. But yeah, HOAs are pretty flexible. Sweet. Awesome, man. Yeah, I always I've always got nervous. Like there's a lot of condos in my market that are um, you know, that that are 
relatively decent price, but they do have like, that's the thing that, I, I, that pisses me off about condos, all these HOA fees that are like hundreds of dollars. And when you add that five or six or $700, that's like having an extra, I know, $100,000 on your payment. So for me, I was always like, do I want to risk getting an STR and then all of a sudden getting regulated when the HOA decides like, hey, you can't have that anymore or whatnot. So it's just something I always thought about. Some places are friendly with them, some aren't, but you never know what can happen. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, like especially here, uh, so this building that I'm in, um, it's it's my in-laws that we're helping uh, get started up down here, but they already have a unit. Um, they uh, they became, my father-in-law is actually the president of the HOA, so nothing's going to change without you know him him being the one that changes it. So, you know, it gives them more control of that, that route. You know, we talk about that all the time. That's awesome. Yeah. When people take over the HOAs, then you can have a say in it. Yeah. It's either yeah. you've got to control the HOA or you're going to get screwed at some point or another. Yep. I got a question on that. Is he blocking everybody else from having a short-term rental and only allowing his, or is he just like... You know, I don't think he's that devious yet, so. <laughs> <laughs> I would. I'd be like, you can't have one. You're cool. You can have one. You can't. I'll keep mine. I think out of the 40-something... I don't think that's how that works. Yeah, I think out of the 40-something units, only like five of them are owner-occupied uh, all year round. The rest of them are all are all STRs, so I don't think that would be a good idea. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, Got it. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Well, you want to dive into about like, you know, let's talk about you, Matt. I know we're talking about HOAs for a minute, but do you want to dive into what you have going on, where you're from, how you and Rafa met? Because I think you guys connected at a meetup um, or whatnot. So or you guys are in the same mastermind, I think, right, Rafa? Some- no, we met up at first. Uh, I think it was on Tony's and Sarah's event and then afterwards yep. in nashville we met up afterwards power of meetups so yeah i met rafa um yeah tony and sarah's event in uh, newport beach i think it was their first one there so um you know my first introduction was rafa was like just this celebrity you know on stage um just sharing his arbitrage not even skills with the world so <laughs> but uh yeah i know we got to know each other a little bit more i think in probably in nashville um at the str wealth conference this last year but um, so a little bit about me, uh, my wife and I are officially full-time real estate investors as of last October. Um, I left my job. I was an account manager with Google at the time, but so, so we're doing, we're doing this, uh, this real estate thing, uh, full-time, uh, you know, all the time, part-time, whatever you want to call it now. But my wife just tells people that I'm unemployed, but, uh, we, uh, we started about nine years ago, um, I was a cell phone sales rep at a Sprint store, uh, slinging phones and making about 35K a year. Um, But we had just gotten married, just got pregnant shortly thereafter, and baby's on the way. My wife wants to be a stay-at-home mom. Um, All of these things, just a whirlwind of like, what the heck are we going to do to, you know, build, um, you know, a life style around this this low income that I had? You know, how are we going to make this work? So our thought process was... um, you know, let's find a way to build passive income. Uh, we had some family, my in-laws actually, who I'm sitting in their condo here today, but where they had done some real estate investing and they kind of, you know, poured into us a little bit about, you know, how that really helped them, um, you know, build passive income. So the issue was though, I couldn't afford a down payment on a property. I could not afford 20% down. So we learned how to be creative though. And, and I found out that I could, you know, essentially buy a property with only 3.5 or 3% down or whatever on a conventional loan as a primary residence, as long as I moved into it. So we found found a house for $90,000. I actually offered him 92. That way uh, he would pay closing costs because I couldn't afford those either. Um, And we we were all in, like we got a first time home buyer credit, everything. It was like 2,500 bucks is all we had to come up with out of pocket uh, to, uh, to move into this first home. We lived in the home for a year as we renovated it. Uh, you know, while we lived there, we renovated it. Um, it was just, you know, old style grandma's home, carpet in the kitchen, all those fun things. Had our first baby there, uh, then moved out, rented it out, and then repeated the process five times. So we house hacked five times in five years as primary residences um, until we kind of built a base from there where we had this, you know, cash flow coming in. These were long term rentals. Um, I didn't know much about the the str space at the time so uh, that's that's what we knew that's what we did um you know and then you know after that point i won't i won't dig into everything but essentially you know we've we've been able to build a, a larger portfolio off of that uh never living off of our cash flow until i left my job i'm just kind of you know bare bones starting to get to where we are today so there's a lot of things you said there first of all what market are you in 
Uh, we're in the Midwest, so we actually live in, uh, well, right off of Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, hey, I actually might be there uh, March. I think I know I, I told you that I'd go down there eventually. I'm going to go down there. But anyway, side story. So uh, I'll reach out for that <clears throat> so we can hang out. But um, okay, so 90000 bucks for your first property, 3.5% down. How many properties do you have now? Uh, we currently have 12. And so how did you scale from, like, give us some more details of how you went from that first one. I know you said it briefly now, but give me some actual details. Like, how did you actually go from that first one to be able to start affording to reinvest into the other ones? Like, give some of those uh, secrets you got there. Yeah, so the first five, uh, we did the same as the first one. So, I mean, it was, you know, 3% down on the first property and then 3% down the second property. We moved into that second property, lived there for a year, rented out the first one, and then fixed up the second property as we lived there. After a year, moved into another one with 3% down and then another one with 3% down and then where we are now with 3% down as well. So, so you're doing FHA, Matt? Never FHA. It was always conventional. Conventional. Got you. Okay. I think you'd yeah. only do one FHA loan. That's right. If I remember correctly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think you can. I, I mean, at the time, like I, I had I had pretty good credit too. Um, even though I had a lower income, I was able to get approved for a conventional one. I think I could only get approved for like up to 100 or 120,000. So it was kind of... You know, <laughs> didn't have a lot to work with, um, yeah. but uh, you know, it, it worked out. So, and you were able to do that all while you were still doing the the, the cell phone thirty five k a year. Yeah, so we yeah. used you know our evenings and our weekends and everything else to uh, to renovate these properties. I mean, we we were having kids while we were living in these as well in construction zones and uh, you know doing doing backsplashes together and learning how to do this stuff through YouTube or whatever else as we, uh, as we saved, you know, we would save a few hundred bucks and then, you know, buy some tile or save a few hundred dollars and, and do some painting or whatever else. So, um, you know, we just, we did that as we lived there and, and, you know, made them nicer properties and then moved out. And now each one of these properties that has also appreciated, um, you know, over double the value of what they were worth when we bought them too. So kind of a win-win there, but, um, but yeah, I mean, since that point, after the first five, we've also gotten creative with financing um, uh, through using like a, a home equity line of credit on our primary residence that helped us to buy five more properties. We also did a flip on a condo down here in South Padre last March, uh, where we were able to uh, uh, to profit a little over $100,000. So we rolled that into, we've got a fourplex and a duplex um, uh, back home as well. So Yeah. So when you when you roll that over like that, you're not getting taxed, right? Because you're basically 1031ing that flip, or are you getting taxed? Um, so if you do if you do a 1031 exchange, then no, um, it mitigates the taxes. Um, but at the time, uh, we were not smart enough to do that, so we did have to uh, pay some taxes. However, we had enough movement um, from our real estate. We also did a cost segregation study um, on a property that we bought, so. That helped to offset a lot of that uh, capital gains taxes that we would have had to pay otherwise. Got it. Because on the hundred k, you'd probably would have looked at what, like thirty grand is for capital probably, gains. Probably. Right around there. Yeah, I think at the end of the year it was like, I don't know, we've got a good CPA as well, so I want to say we only we only paid a couple thousand dollars in total um, out of all of it after everything that we did. So yeah, that's not that's pretty that's good. Not bad at all. So are are you operating all these as short term rentals now, or what are you doing with them all? Long term tenants. Uh, so we've got 10 long-term rentals and then we have two short-term rentals right now. And, uh, we started to do the short-term, what was it? It was, oh, within the last, almost two years ago, we bought our first short-term rental and that's kind of the direction that we're going to be going from, from here on out. Our goal was to have a good base of long-term rentals that paid for our, uh, you know, living expenses and then the income from our short-term rentals would be more of, uh, the fun money, if that's what you want to call it. So. How much are you cash flowing with your long term rentals in comparison to your short term rentals? We do, I would say on average, we do about, I don't know, anywhere from four to six times the amount of cash flow on a short term rental than we do on a long term. Got it. And what's the plan to keep to keep uh, all these as long term rentals or switch them to short term rentals at some point or just add more now focused short term rental properties? So the, uh, the long term rentals that we have, um, I was able to do some refinancing on them back when rates were really low. So I've got, I've got, you know, fixed rates at, uh, anywhere from like 2.65 up to 3.5, um, on all of these conventional loans, 30 year fixed. So I don't plan on selling them. I don't plan on selling them. Um, they also cash flow really well, but they're in neighborhoods that I personally don't feel like would be great for uh, short term rentals. Um, 
potentially maybe a midterm rental in the future, but we'll we'll see. We've got good tenants in place and uh, and they cash flow pretty well right now as they are. So um, that hasn't been a thought of mine yet, but but uh, potentially in the future. So yeah, I mean, dude, I always tell people like even though I do a ton of short term rentals, if my long term rentals cash flowed more, I would not do short term rentals at all and avoid the fucking headache. So, Ralph, I got a question on that. So if you cash flow, Matt, how much, how much are you making? I don't, I don't know if you told us what you're making on those long-term units. Is it a couple hundred bucks? I'm assuming probably. No, no, <laughs> no, we're, we're, uh, we're cash flowing, man, those first five that we had, or I guess first four, cause we're living in the fifth one now, but the first four that we had, we cash flow on average about 800 bucks a month off of each one. I mean, I've got mortgages that are, That's so that are set at like 800 bucks, um, you know, cause I bought these houses for 130 grand or so. And now they're worth two two thirty to two fifty, and they're renting for seventeen to eighteen hundred a month. It's freaking awesome. Is this in the city? Uh, these are like right in the suburbs, off of Des Moines. So I mean, they're in Des Moines, but um, yeah, it's not like right downtown or anything. So they're in, they're in nice, you know, nineteen eighties neighborhoods, B plus properties. Um, I will die with these homes. They they will not be sold. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that. Yeah, I agree. Eight hundred bucks is like for a, a a rental. That's pretty freaking awesome. Yeah. It's yeah. good cash flow. For yeah. sure. I mean, you get 10 of them. That's eight grand. You're solid. I'm, okay. So I want to talk, I want to talk about your, your, I, I don't want to keep going into your financials here. So, but I want to talk about how much you put aside for, cause you know, you could have one vacancy and it, it, it will, I guess not with the 800 bucks, you probably won't get wrecked, but you could have one vacancy. You also have repairs, things like that. Do you remodel all of them to where you don't have any, any maintenance issues? Like how do you handle all this? Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> Like, you know, the first four or five houses that we that we bought, we lived in them. So we, you know, updated them as we were there. Um, so that kind of helps. But I mean, most of them now at this point, like we had a hailstorm come through a few years ago um, and we got all like, you know, five roofs replaced for absolutely nothing. Um, so that was good. But I mean, as far as maintenance goes on a house, I mean, you, you, you'll always have your things come up. I mean, I've got some furnaces and ACs and water heaters that are a little bit older. So I'll need to... Uh, uh, you know, replace those eventually. Typically we try to keep about 10 to $15,000 set aside and kind of an emergency rental fund, um, for when things come up. So, uh, you know, if I use some of that, I just, I just replenish it. Um, that's kind of always been what we've done and it's worked well for us with the amount of properties that we have. Did you always want to get into real estate? Was this always the plan or did you just be like, Hey, I think I'm going to try to buy a property because I heard bigger pockets type of situation. Yeah, Rafa. When I when I was a little boy, I was like, I want to I want to buy rentals someday. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> <I got it. laughs> it was your lifelong dream since you were three years old. You were ready. Yes, uh, yes. No, um, honestly, like when we started investing, uh, when we bought our first home, I, I guess I should say when we moved out of the first home and rented it out. I mean, that first home, like my mortgage on that home was like six hundred and twenty bucks a month. Um, and we rented that thing out for 1200 bucks a month. And that was my first taste of what cash flow really looked like. And I'm like, dang, like, you know, for a guy who's making you know, at the time 30, 35, 40 grand a year to see cash flow of 550 or so a month, like that was crazy good money. Um, and that's when I really first experienced it. Um, you know, my, my long term goal was to eventually have enough properties uh, where the cash flow would would cover, you know, replace my salary. That way I could leave my job. But realistically, I didn't think that it would happen until I was, I remember, I mean, man, even like a few years ago, three, four years ago, I was like, maybe, maybe in my mid forties or, or so mid to late forties, I'll, I'll be able to do it. But, uh, short-term rentals definitely changed the game for us, uh, there too. But, um, but yeah, I mean, like you just, you never know. I mean, if you, if you put yourself out there, you build relationships, um, uh, some of these things just really snowballed for us and, helped us build our portfolio way faster than I ever thought it would, would be. So being, being creative, not just being the guy that's like, I've got to save that 20%, but being the guy of how can I figure out a way to not need to save up for that and find a different method to, uh, to do it. So. I love that dude. That's cool. How long ago did you start with your first property again? We started with our first property. Oh, let's see about nine years ago, 2015. Okay. Yeah. I, I was going to say it had to be quite some time ago. What's your plan right now? Aside from these long-term rentals that you have, because I want to talk a little bit about about how you're managing them and your management style of it, but I'm curious first before that, like because usually when I talk about management, people are preparing for either scaling or they just want to get shit off their plate. So I'm curious, like, what's your plan going forward, and then how are you preparing for whatever your plan is? Yeah, so 
I mean, first off, like for the longest time, our, our goal, like was just get more properties, get more properties, um, build up that cash flow to replace my income. So that way I could leave my job. And that meant, um, you know, a lot of sacrifice on time and the things that we did and everything else. So, uh, we made a commitment from the start that if we could not do this as a family, we were not going to do it. Um, so my wife is very driven and dedicated. And uh, although she was reserved at first with like some of the crazy ideas that I have, um, once we decide to do it, she supports me and pushes me through the, to the end. Um, so she's there. I mean, she's it's not just like a me working. It's an us working together uh, with the kids, um, you know, even helping now as we're getting, you know, I've got a five year old and a seven year old who help paint and, and do other things too. So, um, so there was that, but that really took a toll, um, on us for sure, because we, you know, we would spend, um, especially the last few years, it's like whenever we got a house, it was, you know, 80, hundred hour work weeks where we're over there anytime, you know, I'd, I'd go to my job and then after my job, I'd get off at five or whatever. And then we'd be over at the house until 10 or 11. And then, you know, on the weekends we're there all the time. So it was just, it was a lot of a lot of time and strain on on us and our family. So we actually, I mean, honestly, we took this last year, I would say, off in a sense. So when I left my job in October, I, I actually called and uh, and resigned from the uh, the the parking lot of the office that we closed in because um, I needed proof of employment to get the uh, the conventional loan that I've got it on. But um, we have not purchased another house since then uh, because our goal wasn't to keep growing essentially and keep making more money. It was to have our time back. Um, so we spent this last year doing two things. Uh, one was focusing on our family and growth there and, and uh, me being more of a, of a dad and husband around the house. Um, so we've been able to work on our own home and renovations and stuff there and also work on our family, take a lot of vacations and time, um, which we're doing right now. We're on a three month vacation uh, away from Iowa, uh, you know, on an Island. Uh, so so that was kind of our goal there. And then secondly was to optimize the business that we have now. So, you know, we've got these, we've got these properties and I didn't want to focus on scaling so fast that I lost track of, uh, I'll say the, uh, the, the quality over the quantity, right. Um, which Rafa, I'm sure, you know, you've dealt with some of these growing pains as well, right. Where, you know, you're, you're focused on scaling and it's really hard to, to optimize every property and get the most profit out of each one, um, you know, if you grow too fast, right. And you don't have the right systems. So, so that's what we did was we, we, uh, scaled our amenities. We put hot tubs at our properties. We built in game rooms. We got murals. We did all of these things to make our properties the best. So now if you're looking in Des Moines, um, you know, for a, for a house that that's a little bit larger, we sleep 10 people at one and 14 at the other. Ours are the two top houses. Um, for everything. Um, you will, you will see them and, uh, our revenue way outperforms our competition, uh, because we've spent the time to, to build the quality. That's cool, dude. Yeah. You always got to be able to stand out. So are you using a management software for your long-term rentals and your short-term rentals? How does that look? <clears throat> My long-term rentals? No. Um, since I just have the 10 of them, uh, and they're all like, I would say B plus properties. Uh, we do it on our own. Um, I do have a good team in place. I've got, you know, a HVAC guy, a plumber, a uh, flooring guy um, that I will call for different things. Like, you know, for example, since we've been down here about a week ago, I had a plumbing issue on one of them. So the tenant calls me um, and then I just call my plumber and he was there within an hour and was able to fix the problem right away. But um, so, I mean, I found that when I have higher quality properties that are not, um, you know, in, in less expensive neighborhoods, because you, you invest in less expensive neighborhoods or cheaper places. Typically, you're, you're going to see cheaper tenants. You invest in nicer places. Typically, you're going to get a little bit of higher quality people. Um, I would say on average, I get maybe a call every four to six months um, from one of my long term tenants. So that's pretty, pretty hands off once leases are signed and, and stuff in place. Um, on the short term rentals, we use Hospitable as our property management software, uh, which I absolutely love. Um, I was actually just talking with them yesterday. So uh, great uh, software. And uh, I would say on average, we spend about two to three hours uh, managing our properties, our short term rentals through that. Nice, dude. Yeah, I love Hospitable, dude. I manage everything through it, except for the hotel. Jesse doesn't want to jump on the hospitable train. He's on what IGMS or some weird yeah, property management software. Yeah, IGMS. Um, yeah, ever. You know what? I don't like it because I'm paying fourteen percent um, that management fee. That's the thing that's like killing me, man. When you use IGMS, well, you got to go to hospitable, it. bro. You don't listen to me. 
One of these days you'll listen to me, Jesse. One of these days we'll we'll get you to 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 listen. Yeah, maybe someday. I actually got a question, man, because you, you're I have kids too. Like, are you are you guys homeschooling your kids now since you guys are on? Yeah, yeah. So um, we we actually decided before we were gonna you know do real estate um, that we would homeschool. Um, I was actually homeschooled all the way through myself, and so was my wife. We didn't actually meet through that. Uh, we met as adults, but. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I turned out okay. Um, you know, I'm a little socially awkward. Um, no, but uh, um, we uh, we 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 homeschool and we really enjoy it. So we, I would say, we do it for two reasons. You know, one is the flexibility of you know we can be in a place like where we are right now, um, and uh, and teach them while we're here. But then also we can instill our our morals and values uh, to them also. Uh, but uh, um, yeah, so we we are homeschooling. Yeah, I've been, I've been, I've talked to a lot of friends of mine lately, um, and they're just like, I don't want to have my kids go to school anymore. And they're teaching kids about like, you know, I don't want to get all political and stuff here, but you know, like there's a, a big thing about it on the news, like the kids are learning certain things about genders and whatnot. So people are like, I'm pulling my kids up. Um, so I don't know. I think what it's one of those things, man, where, uh, we're in California. So it's like, I mean, it's a pretty liberal state, but I think that, you know, I mean, we each have our own option what we want to do with our kids. You were, do you, this is a question I have for you, Matt. Do you like looking back at your childhood, do you wish you were, went to a public school or you just like, ah, it's cool. You know, I would say as a kid, like from my perspective back then, I had mixed feelings. Like I, I at first I would say, yes, I wanted to because uh, it just didn't seem normal. But I mean, back then, like homeschooling was not like it is today. It was not as popular. So it was, it was a lot more rare, but uh, as a high schooler, um, I did like a dual enrolled thing. So I actually got to go take classes on Mondays with other homeschoolers, um, and then have homework for the rest of the week. Uh, there was about 300 of us that, that met, uh, once, once a week. So I was able to build friendships through there. We were also part of different homeschool groups that did like field trips to certain places. Um, so I, I, you know, was socialized through that. I, I dual enrolled for sports. Um, so I did like basketball and, um, uh, soccer and stuff like that through, through the school. Um, so, so I was able to still get a, you know, a, a feeling for it without actually going to it. But, uh, later on, uh, especially like in, in high school, I, I thoroughly like enjoyed being homeschooled because I was able to go at my own pace. Right. So where in a school, you might have to just go at the pace of whatever they're teaching in class. Like if I was ahead on something, I could just skip by it essentially. So as a junior, I only did like three classes. And as a senior, I did one. Um, it was like Spanish, I think, because that's all I had left. So I was able to start working full time. And then I went to college and uh, I was able to graduate debt free because of a lot of that that I had saved up uh, from working as well. So it just kind of kind of helped with with that for sure. Yeah, that's cool. I, I always get curious on like, um, you know, homeschooling. It's it's like, I think when you, when you want to travel, like for 2024, one of my goals, is like I want to travel, you know, I got kids, my, I have a 16 year old son in high school an 11 year old son who's still in high school, a 20 year old is going to college, um, out of, out of the area. And I'm just like, I want to be able to just kind of go and, you know, thankfully enough, I'm in the position now where what I do, I could do it from anywhere. Just like Rafa, like, I mean, you could do that too. And yeah. I'm to the point too, where I'm like, should I just pull my kids out and we go live in freaking Austin for three months. And then we move over to freaking, you know. Chicago for another, you know, not in the winter. I do love that. It's my favorite city in the U S but like just kind of move around and do things, you know what I mean? But, yep, um, yep. I don't like, I don't feel like lately I haven't been, I haven't been happy with being like tied down. Like, cause you know, the kids are going to school and stuff, but it would be a cool little fun little trip. And some of my, some of my really good friends, like my mentors, they homeschool their kids up until they just turned 16. They just, they just enrolled them in school, but they were homeschooled yep. from, you know, five years old all the way through 16 and they just traveled everywhere. And, um, Yep. Yeah. Yep. The wife, uh, one of my friends, Daniel, his wife is just like, I'm, we're tired of home. I'm tired of homeschooling because she's the one doing it. And, and Daniel's out working all the time. So they finally decided like, oh, we're not going to do homeschooling anymore. We're going to, you know, it's, we're going to send them back to school. But they traveled yeah, and they were like everywhere. They're all over the place. All of my investor friends are all their, all their kids are being homeschooled. All, every single one of them. And th these are all like, you know, real estate investors, people that own businesses, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I like I like how he says all of my friends and uh, and and you don't homeschool Jesse. So I mean, where does that leave you? I don't, I don't know. What <laughs> no, investor <laughs> friends. That's all my investor friends. Jesse's the only one that's yeah. like weird. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a I I don't mind school. That's one one reason why I was asking. Like, I I learned uh, absolutely nothing in school. So um, <laughs> so I mean, I just I don't know, man. I I I'm the kind of guy like, dude. Well, you know what I learned in school, man. I'm gonna be honest with you guys. I learned how to smoke weed and skate with people and ditch and like that's what I learned in. in 
high school and stuff. Like truthfully, um, I was around the wrong people. I was around the wrong crowd. I mean, would I have found those people if I was homeschooled? I don't know. Maybe. But I mean, I, I turned it's out different, so- dude. It's different. Like I turned you know, out sort of all right. <laughs> yeah, you're okay, dude. You're, I think I think you're doing okay for yourself right now. <laughs> oh, that's funny, man. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I think it's I think it's a different thing for everybody. Um, you know, like everybody get we get to choose if we want to do with our kids if they want to go to freaking you know, like even college lately, Raph. I haven't talked to you about this, but like my daughter's going to college, and I'm like in my back of my head. Hopefully, she's not listening to this. I'm like, does she really need to go to college, or you know? It's just one of those things, man. I'm paying for it. She's going to San Diego. That shit is fucking expensive. You know what I mean? Um, but it's also she's going to be a CPA, and like I know a bunch of CPAs. Like, is that is that the really the right right spot for her to go? But I just want her to be happy, dude. You probably want the same for your kids. Like, whatever's going to make you happy. Oh, yeah. It's not a financial thing. Like, granted, having having money is cool and everything, but if you're not happy, then Matt, how old are you, kids? Uh, I've got a seven year old daughter, five year old daughter three-year-old son and four-month-old son so and we are done i i cannot i cannot do anymore <laughs> i love him to death sure you don't want another two or three yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm positive. I'm, I'm yeah. Positive. yeah four is a good number i i it's me in my family there's four of us me my twin brother my sister and my younger brother and we turned out pretty good so i think they're gonna have some fun all right i want to i want to go back a little bit now that we're talking on the family aspect i'm curious like because you said you guys you would only invest in real estate if you guys did it as a unit together, right? How does that aside from the homeschooling, like how does it affect your lifestyle? Do you have to make certain choices a certain way? Because uh, you just said you just quit your job, what you were doing it while you were working, and you have the family and the kids. Like, how does that look with with everybody? And I ask from a perspective of like, if there's somebody out there that's thinking of getting started, and they're like, oh, I can't do it. I don't have the time. I have a job. I have a son. I have a daughter. Like you made it work. I'm curious as to how that happened. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So, um, you know, something that really resonated, resonated with me while, uh, it was a quote that I heard. Um, and this is one of my, one of my favorite quotes, um, uh, still to this day, I don't even know who said it, which I really should know who said it. Cause I love the quote, but use your weekends and evenings to build the life you want to not escape the life you have. And I feel like there's just so many people that, um, you know, the two biggest hole ups for investing in real estate are time and money. I don't have the time. I don't have the money. Um, and I would say like, if you convince yourself that something's impossible long enough, um, it's, that's going to become your reality. Um, you know, I, I, there was many times that we could have made the excuse that we don't have the time, uh, you know, I'm working full time or whatever else and we've got the kids and, and all of these things, but it's just like, we wanted this so bad, uh, that we, we made the time, uh, that we, found ways to be creative uh, by moving into the home. So there's a lot of people out there that wouldn't want to do that. You know, who's going to want to move their family into some, uh, you know, fixer upper home and live there, uh, you know, cause it's out of their comfort zone, right? It was out of our comfort zone, but we wanted it bad enough that we, we did this and, and we made it work because of that. So, yeah. It always goes down to how bad do you want it, right? Like nobody's willing to, like, what's that saying? Everybody wants, I don't know what it is, but they don't put in the time. I don't know. Yeah. No, it's like, you want the freedom and you want the money, but you're not willing to put in the time type of situation or make the sacrifices, right? I know some like really wealthy investors, like I mean like extremely wealthy, and they still jump from house to house so that they can do the tax savings every two years. And it's like to them, that's a normal thing. It doesn't even matter to them. I mean, I guess when you're traveling that much, it doesn't really matter. But it's funny that like other people aren't really willing to put in the time or effort or the sacrifices to be able to get that future. I mean, look. You did your foundation for what nine years, and you're finally seeing the fruits of your labor, right? You now have the freedom to do what you want. Um, you were able to do all the work. You have to put in a lot of sacrifice over the last nine years. Live in property, sell the, I mean, uh, uh, buy another property, move, right? Rent that property, um, and then reinvest the money that you've been making. Most people take that and then they just jump ship with a little bit of profits, and they're like, "Hey, I'm golden, you know, I'm good." Um, and everybody's, you know, we've all done it. I've done it where I've been complacent, but then I realized, Hey, I need to get my shit together and keep growing. That's the way, that's the way it is. But you got to be willing to make the sacrifices on the things that really will set you up for just like long-term wealth, success, happiness, you know, that ultimate goal. So speaking of goals, what's, what's, what's your goal here, Matt? What are you trying to do, man? Are you just like, you said you took a year off, which is great, but are you getting back into it? What's the, what's the plan? Yeah. So we got some things moving. We got some things moving, Rafa. Uh, so we, uh, uh, we just did a cash out refi on one of our uh, short term rentals that we purchased the last house that we purchased. Actually, uh, we got it 
um, reappraised uh, and it came back. Uh, we bought this thing for 160. We put about 40 into it and it just came back at 300. So we pulled uh, pulled some money out of there. Um, we're looking to, uh, to we're looking to hopefully do. Um, uh, I don't know. Our goal is our goal is at least three, if not four, properties this next year. So uh, we want to we want to start doing some more unique experiences. Um, so I'm actually looking for some land potentially. Uh, to uh, to do something on. I'm not quite sure yet, and I don't know if I want to share exactly what what I'm thinking, but it'll be something unique to Iowa if if this comes to be. So, um, wanna wanna you know have a couple more that are larger single family homes that we do for short term rentals. Um, I'm also thinking about uh, maybe doing like a duplex and having mid term on one side and uh, short term on the other side. Um, I need to talk more to Jesse uh, about some of this uh, MTR stuff because uh, I have not done any yet, but. Uh, um, but yeah, no, we, we, we've taken the year off, we've grown, um, we've, we, uh, built up our rentals that we have now, and now we're looking to, to get back into it. Um, you know, not super fast paced, but, um, we're getting kind of bored. So we want to, want to keep, keep doing more. And, um, I am also working, uh, I will not say who with yet, um, but, uh, working with, uh, some other creators, uh, to put together, um, a course and, uh, wanting to, uh, hopefully help other investors, uh, who are on the edge about getting into real estate investing, or maybe some that have already, but wanting to, to learn how to grow. Um, so we're, uh, we're going to be hopefully rolling out this at the beginning of the year as well. So, but, uh, but yeah, Absolutely. so I think you should totally take advantage of that. Yeah. 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 I mean, I've seen your content, obviously. You know, uh, Jesse, you don't know, dude, but uh, Matt over here is uh, he's a celebrity, bro, on TikTok. He's he's, he's is he? yeah, he's he's got a big following and he drops good content. <laughs> oh, you're, uh, you're a TikTok celebrity, bro. Celebrity. You drop good content. About... I like your content. Yeah, I got a question about TikTok, dude. Like, is TikTok? Well, I guess you don't have anywhere for to drive people. Like, you're not. They're not. You're not selling anything right now, right? You're just getting views. <laughs> Yes. I mean, my main thing has been, uh, I mean, I, have started doing content creation because I enjoyed it and because I wanted to see, you know, help other people. That's kind of what got us into doing short-term rentals was watching other guys, uh, be successful with it. Uh, Michael Elefante, uh, the real estate Robinson, some of those guys I watched and, and that encouraged me to do it. So that's why I started doing it. Um, but it just, it blew up a lot bigger than what I thought. So, um, I, I mean, honestly, like views have been great. I do a lot of collaborations as well. So like I've worked with Price Labs, Hospitable, uh, found a couple of these other um, companies to, uh, to create content. So like, I mean, the monetization possibilities are pretty good, especially with TikTok. Um, uh, I am just starting to grow Instagram a little bit more too, but, but yeah, views and uh, like paid promotions are kind of the two biggest things for me over there. TikTok, cool. Yeah, I've been. I've, that's one of those things that's like super hard for me to 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 tap into. And you know, I've been. Ta I've talked to a couple like influencer. I hate the word influencer. Like educators in the space, and they're just like TikTok's hard because people are just scrolling for attention, but they're not actually like diving into your stuff. They're just watching it and kind of scrolling through. And Instagram is more of like that's your audience. Those are your people. They're not just some randoms that are just watching stuff. But again, I haven't grown on TikTok, so I don't know what that what that's even like, or I'd be able to pull from that, but. That's cool, man. I think right audience is the new audience. Capturing audience is the new way to 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 run a business. It's 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 powerful. Um, and in fact, yesterday I was just talking to somebody that has like I don't know six thousand followers on Instagram and is doing almost a million dollars in 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 a course business right now from literally wow. six thousand people. So wow. it's pretty cool, man. Like it's it's cool to watch people that build stuff um, without having these crazy followers, without having all these things. They just have good content. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's, that's kind of, that's kind of my thing is, you know, I, I never wanted to be the guy that here I am just trying to sell something. It was, um, you know, I want to, I want to just, I don't know, show off like our life, what we're doing and be able to help answer questions and help other people find financial freedom. And if putting together a structured course, um, you know, that, that goes through the different avenues of how to do that, is something that can help people that I'm all on board for that too. So that's kind of what's, you know, got my mind on, on doing that too. So. Uh, you have a YouTube channel or are you just doing TikTok? Do I have a YouTube channel? Yes. Have I created content for that YouTube channel? No, I have not. I think I've got like two videos on there right now and I don't know, maybe, maybe 15 followers. So no, <laughs> the answer is no. That's the goal, dude. If you're wanting to build a course and you want to do like, get on, get on YouTube. That's where people like get to know, yeah. like, and trust you. They watch your long, long format stuff. 
That's what um, I'm hearing. That's the way to do it. I mean, that's what's worked for me, but I mean, it's, it's cool, man. Once you get that going, I think it's, it's a good piece of the puzzle. Courses are, courses are tough too, man. That's a hard, that's a hard thing. Yeah. It's a lot you, of work. You guys, do, you guys do great stuff. So I, lo- I love watching your guys' content. So you guys, you guys do great. Yeah. I think Rafa and I are actually going to be recording content together. Danny just hit me up, Rafa. He's like, Hey, when are you going to be, um, I think he's going out to Alvin's thing in Los Angeles in January. Nice. So you're going to be there at that. Yeah, Rafa? There. Sweet. So Matt, I, I, we're getting to the top of the hour here, dude. And I want to ask you, I want to have some time here to talk about being that this is the big break show. Tell us a little bit about if you have a big break, what do you have a defining moment in your life? Something that made you go from, you know, regular old three year old, not wanting to invest in real estate, Matt, to, you know, the new real estate investor that you are today. Yeah. Um, you know, I would say like for me, one of them was getting married to, uh, my wife today. Um, you know, we've been married a little over nine years now and, um, you know, her parents, uh, you know, I guess seeing this guy who was a meat cutter at a grocery store, uh, for 20 something years, who started buying rental properties and this guy's now spending, you know, a month out of the year on, uh, I think they were doing like Tucson at that time. And he was like 50, oh, 53 years old, um, and retired. Uh, and, uh, you know, just seeing him be able to do something like that, that was a big like motivator for me of like, Hey, this is something that this guy's done or, you know, these are like her parents have done, uh, and to be able to see that and, and have them help mentor us a little bit. But, Um, I would say that was one of them. Uh, and then the second one, I guess just like really, I don't know if there was like this, this single moment, but it was this time when I realized that real estate is something that can be used as a tool to set you financially free. It's not just something that you can use to build passive income. Um, not that anything is ever hundred percent passive, but, uh, as like supplemental income, but, uh, it's something that can actually set you free and financial freedom isn't just about, um, you know, I had this illusion. It was about making millions of dollars a year because it's not. It's about having your time to do with what you want to do, uh, when you want to do it and where you want to do it. Um, and, uh, and that's what we were able to achieve. And that was probably four, three, four years ago when I really like it set in that this is a reality. Um, and then just chasing after that until we got there. I love that, dude. That's yeah. great. There's something beautiful about not waking up to an alarm clock, right? Yeah, yeah. Now I just wake up to children instead. So, <laughs> no, dude, just that feeling of like I, I remember like going to work, like my alarm clock would go off. I'm like, fuck, I got to get up and like you know, you just do get up and do the routine. There's just this feeling of dread of doing it, but it's different when you wake up to your kids and they're jumping on you and oh yeah, you get to decide you might have a bunch of shit to do, but then you figure it out later on. You can move stuff around. But that feeling of just going to work, dude, Rafa, do you remember that feeling? Like that alarm clock going off and you're just like. My alarm goes off every day at 6 a.m. and I fucking hate it, but that's to go to the gym. So, <laughs> I was going to yeah. say, yeah, while I've been here, um, I've, I've got an alarm at uh, 6.15 that goes off. And uh, I've been rotating between my kids every morning because uh, we, we're, not, we're not in an ocean view condo here, but we're, uh, we wanted something a little bit bigger ground floor. And we were focused on the pool more than anything and we found, found a nice place. But it's like a five-minute walk out to the beach. So I, I wake one of them up and we walk out and watch the sunrise every morning and walk two or three miles together. And so I've got to have an alarm for that. Otherwise I just miss it. But, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's for good reasons. Not for, not for work. Yeah. See those, that's different though. You're waking up to something you want to do, not to go to work. Yeah. That's a total, total different thing. Matt, what would you say would be an actionable step, um, that somebody could take after listening to this episode, like some kind of piece of advice you give somebody? I'm going to say another quote and I had to look this quote up because I, uh, I knew it, but I didn't know it well enough. Um, this is actually a Warren Buffett quote. I'm pretty sure. Um, I, I'm a quote guy, so I, I, li- I like my quotes, but um, this is something that I feel like is applicable, especially in like today right now. Um, but it is uh, be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. Um, and uh, I don't know if greedy is necessarily the right word um, to apply to this, but Uh, you know, I think our biggest moments in real estate have been in the last 18. Well, I mean, we haven't bought anything in the last year. So, you know, the last year before that's maybe maybe the last two years, we did a lot of movement in 2022, um, was our biggest year, uh, where 
I mean, to be honest, like I made 10 times more in that one year from real estate investing than I made from my salary. Um, so, uh, and this is when everybody else was saying, don't buy it, don't buy it. Like it's too competitive. Uh, interest rates are going up. Uh, you know, we shouldn't be, shouldn't be buying real estate. That's what people are saying right now. But like right now is the time to buy because when interest rates do go back down, uh, which is, you know, at least I don't know if anybody really knows what's going to happen, but from what I'm hearing, it's going to start going back down maybe before it drops this next year. And when it does, the market's just going to become more competitive. Like don't marry the property, um, you know, marry or, well, what is the quote? I'm going to get this totally like mixed up here, but don't, uh, don't, the rate. Yeah. yeah, don't, yeah, there you go. So, cause you can refinance later. It's like I now when properties are a little less expensive and refinance later, um, buy now, yeah. uh, you know, stop waiting for the right time. Cause the right time is never going to happen by now. Yeah. I got a couple of properties that I'm like, I have money to pull out of, but I, I got a refi dude. So like, I can't, re I'm not going to refi at a 6% to refi into a seven and a half percent. So I got to, yeah, uh, dude, I just, I just, I just, did, I just did that, but it made sense. So it was a 6% that we refied into a 7.5, but it, it put another 70 grand in front of me that I can use to buy another, another property. So, uh, I'll know the, the cash flow will, will help. Plus I was using a, a HELOC, which was already at a 9.5, um, uh, interest only. So interest rate. I'm actually saving money by doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, there's certain situations where it's like, yeah, you gotta like, you know, if it makes sense financially and all that stuff, but again, who knows I mean, the rates, I mean, if they go down next year, that'd be awesome. But I also don't trust what the feds are saying when it says rates are no, down. No, who knows, man, yeah. like you know, hope for sunshine, prepare for rain. Right. Rafa? Nobody does. Yeah. Don't look at the interest rates. Don't look at the, you know, even the price of the property, look at the cash flow. And if the cash flow makes sense, then, then buy it. So, yeah, I'm buying a bunch of properties right now at high ass interest rates, eight and a half shit like that. And uh, I'm excited about it because when the interest rates drop, I'm going to, I'm going to refi and the value of the property is probably going to go up anyway because Mark, the prices will probably go up. What you're buying right now, does it work as a long-term rental? Like do the cash, do the numbers work for that? Or is it only barely, like, barely? barely. like I'm, I'll be breaking even, but I'm okay with that. Cause I have a business that cash flows that can cover significant amount. So, um, yeah, barely covering. Yeah. I'm with you on that. Even if it was negative a couple hundred bucks, like, dude, that's a property. You know what I mean? Like the thing I is just, that I'm, I'm buying big properties now, you know, they're not like they're and, and I'm not buying in the city. I'm buying in vacation rental markets. So I don't have to worry about long-term rentals. So to me, there's only two of them that were, were actually in the city and that's the Milwaukee one and uh, a different one. And the, if, if Milwaukee doesn't work as a short-term rental. It's large enough to where I can get enough for a, for a family to move in because it's a five bedroom house. So, you know, um, and it's in a prime location. So to me, it doesn't really matter. And then the vacation rental ones, I mean, I'm looking for vacation rental numbers anyway, and we're standing out way above everybody else with the amenities we're pumping into them. So, you know, but again, I also know what the hell I'm doing and I've been doing it for a long time and I, I like to take risks more than most people. So. Yeah, those are the JT ones that you bought. <clears throat> two of them. Two. Of them. Actually, I just picked up two more in JT, 100% seller finance. So that adds to the pool now. I'm gonna have five there. I don't even want to buy anything out there. Actually, I'm gonna have six there. It's funny. So anyway, but uh, Matt, what's the? Let's not talk about me and my investments anymore. Matt, what's uh, what's the greatest uh, or best advice you've ever received? Drop it on you're, me, bro. You're fine, dude. I, I love listening to your success. So I I need to uh, we need to get together if you're in Iowa. So. The best advice that I've ever had. Oh my goodness. You know, I would say like the biggest thing, and, and I feel like this is just beating a dead horse here, but like, like don't, don't wait, um, you know, and find a way to, to make it happen. If you want this bad enough, you're going to find a way to make it happen. Whether that be, um, you know, uh, moving into a house at 3% down as a primary residence or using your current primary residence, um, you know, to leverage the equity in it through a home equity line of credit or finding other people and doing a joint venture or um, arbitrage or something else. It's like, it's not all about, I don't have the money for a 20% down payment, like find a way to make it happen. Um, and uh, uh, my father-in-law had to say some of this to me to really like get this into my head. Um, and then I was listening, I don't even know, it's probably bigger pockets or something that uh, I heard this advice as well, but like, um, you know, teach yourself how to make it happen. Um, it's still possible, even in this market. My brother-in-law um, and sister just bought their first investment property. Uh, I had to really push them. I'm trying to convert all of my family to do it, but 
uh, even, you know, this was just earlier this year, I want to say uh, May or June, um, they bought a property for $135,000. Uh, it's a three bed, one bath house uh, in Iowa. And they're renting this thing out for fifteen twenty five. Uh, he he used a line of credit for the down payment and he's cash flowing about 500 bucks a month. Um, we did renovations together. Um, he was there on his weekends and evenings. Um, so like, don't, don't give up. Don't convince yourself that it's not possible. Um, if you want it bad enough, you'll find a way. Teach yourself how to make it happen. is probably the best thing I've ever heard here. Cause everybody wants everything handed on a silver platter, everybody. And it's like, dude, like figure it out. Yeah. Not only that, but like people are always like, oh, you're going to get burnt out and like you, this is going to whatever it's going to get to you. And you're like, dude, that's what it, that's what it takes to, to, to build these things. <laughs> like it, yeah. It's it, not, it's not easy. and It doesn't happen overnight. I mean, I know Rafa, I mean, I know you've had some, some hills and valleys that you've gone through in your business and you know, some, mm-hmm. some great things and some not so great things, but you, you push through it even when stuff 100%. got hard and, and, uh, and got to where you are today. So, um, you know, you don't just wake up one day and, you know, be given a bunch of properties on a platter. You gotta, you gotta work for it. For sure, man. Matt, where can folks find you at on your TikTok or in the Instagram? Yeah. So, um, you know, this is the first username I, I selected and I, you know, for some reason it was available. So I've just kind of stuck with it, but rental cash flow is my username through TikTok and through Instagram, uh, rental dot cash flow or rental cash flow. If you just look up rental cash flow, you'll find me. Matt Kruger is the name. Um, and, uh, helping people invest in real estate is the game. So, uh, give me a follow on TikTok is my main one. Instagram is kind Let of true, do it all pro kind of <laughs> trying to, trying to build up the Insta, but, uh, TikTok is where I'm at right now. So yeah, rental cash flow. Sweet, Matt. Thanks for being here, dude. It's cool hearing your story. Yeah. Thanks for having me guys. Matt, thanks for coming on buddy. Yeah. Your content's great, man. So keep up the good work and uh, we'll chat. Thanks for being on. Appreciate it.